pleasure to have your uh, company and attention this uh, evening. And it's my <clears throat> honor and privilege to host uh, two of our friends from the Miamia Center. And if I butcher any bits of understanding information, Kara, George, please, you guys are patient and friendly, so correct me uh, what, you know, as I'm going or once I'm done. So as Daryl, Karen Strauss, uh, and Kevin and I were talking about um, having this evening back in, uh, in the spring, uh, Daryl was very, uh, you know, intentional in pointing out that Miami Center is the representative of Miami tribe of Oklahoma, who were extirpated and forced relocated to Oklahoma from the Miami River Valley and um, Western Ohio, Eastern Indiana and surrounding regions. And this is, uh, this center is um, initiated and led by the tribe on campus. So the university is a supporter, not necessarily an employer of the center. Um, and the center's work, um, <clears throat> as I was looking at their website, uh, focuses on two main areas. One is doing actual preservation and conservation and regeneration work around ethnology and culture, especially uh, language and um, understanding and re reconnection of um, Miami people to their landscape now. Um, and the other aspect is what they are doing here today a little bit is, is engaging with the broader Miami community and telling us, uh, or you know, being our guide in understanding how this landscape was and how we are making peace with this, our history. It's a shared history of you know, being a Miami community, university community members. So those are the two main, uh, uh, you know, region or focal area of Miami, uh, Miami Center on campus. And George, I, I want to just read that next bit because I don't want to butcher any bit of information. Um, is the assistant director of Miami Center and the director of the education office. And his graduate research was focused on the Miami Indian village of uh, Picawillany, which was located in Western Ohio. And as a tribal educator and a former public school teacher, those are some of those, some of those people are here, uh, you know, school teachers. Uh, George is interested in uh, the study of indigenous pedagogy, uh, especially Miami, uh, Miami perspective of education. And then our friend Kara Strauss is the director of Miami Tribe of uh, Tribe Relations Office on campus uh, within the Miami Center, and she is a graduate of Miami University. Her graduate work focused on pedagogical theories, how pedagogical theories can be applied to the success of uh, Miami students. Um, and <clears throat> Kara works with the Miami students as well as the broader Miami University community. And she has co-led the development of a number of flagship programs at the Miami Center. And uh, I know through the grapevine, because we have common friends, that Kara is also an accomplished practitioner of uh, and teacher of and curator of ribbon work, uh, which is a traditional Miami art form. And if we get to chat and get to chatting about that later, that'd be awesome too. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome Kara and George. Thank you so very much. The floor is yours. Metamenila, inya, newe shafka, aya chekewea, tepewe newa kakoke waha nungi kakikwe. Kinde Linda Kaninge, Nila Miami Ameto Senia, Meme Shiki Wenswane, Saka Chakwa, Pejoa, Polanazwa, Ne Takamwa, Ilapikasiane, Ne He Miami Ewe Makeke, Minu Te Cheke, Uyak Cheke, Wapa Shiki Sipionge, uh, Wapangia kam yonge, ne he nujongi sipionge, uh, nungi kakikwe. Um, to start off by saying that, Newe, thank you to Shafkat for the, the wonderful introductions, and it's good to see all of you here tonight on our computer screens. Um, <clears throat> normally I say, uh, I wish we were all in person, but I think I understand this group's almost always uh, gathering this way, so um, uh, I think it's uh, it was a struggle for us as a community to adapt to this environment, but it seems like you all have made this adaption well ahead of us. So I look forward to um, look forward to good discussion interactions um, on Zoom with you all tonight. Um, I'm a, in addition to um, my work at the Miami Center, I'm a citizen of the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. 
um, and I just I descend from from two family groups, Pinjewa and Takamwa, whose descendants are known by uh, the French surname the Richardvilles, and from Polanizwa and Sakachakwa, whose descendants are known as the from the, by the French surname the Godfroys. Um, and I have uh, Miami Akin uh, to this day living in the Wabash River Valley in what is today Indiana, in uh, eastern Kansas in the Murdazin River Valley, just to the south of Kansas City, um, on our, our first reservation after forced relocation, and today in the sovereign center of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, um, our, our nation in the Neosho River Valley in northeastern Oklahoma. Um, and we'll Kara and I will come back to talking about those three population centers in our community today, but I wanted to, to start by grounding myself in, in my family and my place. Yeah. So hello everyone, it, it's really good to see you all tonight. My name is Kara Strauss and um, I am also a citizen of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. Um, I also descend um, from, from one of the family groups that, that George mentioned, the Richard Bell family, um, as well as um, the LaFontaine family, including my grandmother, um, who I've learned much from <laughs> throughout my lifetime. Um, and I grew up in um, Huntington, Indiana, which is right along the Wabash River Valley. I'm going to share mm -hmm. the slides. Yeah. Does everyone see so, that okay? Yes. Uh, thanks. Our intention tonight is to start off with a few slides and provide some information that we think will be contextually important for um, what well, we hope to be a conversation for a good chunk of our time tonight. So um, we'll start with a few slides and then would love to have questions from you all. Um, we start out with, with this slide, the Miamia Heritage logo, um, because this is um, something that was created to visually represent the relationship between the Miami tribe of Oklahoma and Miami University. Um, so this logo here was created um, jointly by a designer from the Miami tribe, Julie Olds, who's the cultural resource officer for the Miami tribe, um, as well as a designer from Miami University, Elise Capaccio from University Communications and Marketing. And it is inspired by the Miami form, uh, um, art form of ribbon work, which Shafkat um, explained is a, a traditional art form. Um, which both George and I practice. Um, and we wanted to make sure that this logo was inspired by ribbon work, but was not appropriating ribbon work. And I'll get into that more in just one second. Um, each piece of it is deeply meaningful. So the left diamond, the black diamond represents the Miami tribe, um, our you know, deep ties to our homelands. The right side, the red diamond represents Miami University and, and a commitment to gain knowledge. And then we come together in that white diamond in the middle. Um, and that's where we practice this idea of nape wandinge, um, this word that's up here, learning from each other, which is what we see as the primary goal of this relationship. However, I think the most important piece of this um, logo is that red dot that's at the center. And it's, it's quite important for two reasons. The first is that the, the red dot symbolizes fire. Um, and what is a fire? It's something that you build to sit around for warmth, to build community. But if you don't tend a fire, it will go out. Um, so this is a visual reminder to both sides of this relationship that we must tend this fire in order for the relationship to move forward. Um, and the second reason um, is because 
for those of us who um, recognize Miami ribbon work, that is the thing that makes us very unique and different. Um, you would never see a circle like that in a ribbon work pattern. And so that's the piece that we feel like takes it um, away from being a ribbon work pattern to something that is simply inspired by, by ribbon work. Um, this relationship between the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma and Miami University is, is very unique. We don't know of any other institutions that have a relationship quite like ours. It started in 1972, so we're coming up on our 50th anniversary, which we will be celebrating next year, um, and we'll have lots of programming um, in 2022. So if you'd like to learn more, there will certainly be other opportunities. Um, but this relationship started when the chief of the Miami tribe at that time, Chief Forrest Olds, he came to Miami University unexpectedly. He went to Cincinnati on tribal business, but had always heard that there was this university that carried the name of our tribal people. Um, and so he decided to visit and he went to the president's office entirely unannounced. Um, and so I always like to imagine what that would have been like to be working in the president's office that day when the, the chief of the Miami tribe arrives and introduces himself. Um, and unfortunately, the, the president of the university at that time, President Schreiber, he was out that day. However, some folks took him on a tour. They actually took him to football practice. Um, and that was the start of this now 50 year old relationship. And really for the first couple of decades, the relationship was mostly that. It was individual people building community with one another. Um, so Chief Olds actually dies a few years later, but Chief Floyd Leonard, um, who was elected after him, he was chief for almost 30 years and he be, built really deep relationships with presidents, vice presidents, um, the Alumni Association with faculty across campus. Um, and that's what sustained the relationship for a couple of decades. Um, but in the early 90s, the relationship really became more grounded in the idea of education. Um, education for Miami University community through presentations and programs and places on campus where you could learn about this relationship but also education for the Miamia community. And so it was in 1991 that our first three Miamia students came to Miami University as part of the Miamia Heritage Award. Um, so Miamia students do receive a tuition waiver to attend Miami University. Um, and that was kind of all that there was for them for a while was this financial aid package. Um, and that was the case for really another decade until 2001 which is when the Miamia Center was founded. Um, so the, the Miamia Center was created out of community need. Our tribe was really um, building this revitalization process of language and cultural revitalization. And um, they knew that they needed additional resources and help and turned to their friends at Miami University um, to see if there was some way in which they could support this process. Um, and so the Miami Center was created. Um, Miami University agreed to support it for three years. Um, and we just kind of never looked back from there. It's continued to grow significantly over time. Um, we went from one employee in 2001 to today we have 16 full and part-time staff members of the center. Um, and one of the things, and we can talk about many things that we do, um, is the, the work with our Miamia students. So that has also continued to grow. Today, we have 39 Miamia students who attend Miami University. We have 100 graduates of our program. Um, and for a community like ours of about 6,000 tribal citizens, we're building a very large cohort of people who've had the opportunity to come to Miami University and not just get a wonderful undergraduate education, but to learn about what it means to be a, a Miamia person. So with that, I think I'll turn it over and Chachinza, you can give us a little bit more of a history lesson. So our our, our topic tonight um, is uh, Miao Myonge, the place of the Miami, um, our, our homelands. And Karen and I are going to share with you 
um, starting sort of now jumping to the past, um, a history of our relationship with our homelands, um, but also a discussion about how through revitalization, we are um, recognizing connections that were never severed um, between ourselves and our homelands, um, but then also highlighting um, connections that have been strengthened or in some cases um, reawakened after being uh, silent and um, unrecognized or unpracticed um, for at least a generation in our community. Um, so this this space that you see here on this map is um, is a place that today we call Miao Myeonggi. Um, it's a place where our ancestors lived prior to contact with Europeans. Um, we recognize that that's, that's a name we've given the space. Um, they didn't call it that, um, but rather this is the place where they lived, the place where they um, practiced their, their life ways. Um, it was a foundation of every aspect of our community. Um, and it's defined by river valleys. So in our revitalization work for language revitalization, a part of what we revitalized was a geographic and cartographic understanding of who we were and who we are as a people. And many times we use language to frame that. And so this map was created using the, the source material of our language resources and basically putting all the river names onto a map. Um, well, almost all the river names. Um, and then using that to create the space where our ancestors um, lived. Um, and then that was correlated with historical research. Um, and so then this gives us a, a really a cultural space um, where our, our people lived for, we say, um, from time immemorial or Mijimaha. Um, and it, the, the river names themselves um, teach us, um, and we use them today to teach our teach our students and our, our broader community about our relationships uh, to our homelands, to the people and other beings that we shared our homelands with, um, because this isn't a nation state. This isn't exclusively a Miami realm, nor is it exclusively, obviously, a human realm. Um, and for me as a young person um, starting language revitalization work in my late teens, um, it really uh, stuck almost stuck with me almost immediately the way in which our place names tell stories about the name itself tells a story an encapsulated story about um, our homeland and in, in it it um, provides uh, really powerful examples of what um, an anthropologist working with a totally different community Keith Basso working with the Western Apache described as as sitting in places that wisdom or stories actually sit in places and that the landscape is our storybook um, for people who were pre-literate prior to contact with Europeans um, the land is how we stored and maintained and recounted our stories and our, our place names highlight this in in lots of um, really um, wonderful ways um, let me see Turn on the laser pointer. There we go. Oops. Uh, can, everyone see, can everyone see my mouse moving around? I might just use that. Okay, perfect. Um, so, in in terms of um, in terms of positioning ourselves, where where we are tonight, those of us who are in Oxford, like Kara and I. Um, we're down here where my laser, where right, where the pointer is, um, in the um, in our language, the Asenisipe, um, or in English, the Great Miami River Valley. Um, so that's one of the things that is really powerful when you use our language as an interpretive lens. Things that are actually named after us, um, we didn't name; other people named them, and so we have our own names in the landscape that are uh, obviously very different. But they also show like a different perception of place. So um, we don't historically name things after ourselves and yet our name is all over the landscape in uh, the Great Lakes as well as down in in Oklahoma and in Kansas because other people named things after us um, while we were living there um, and then where my family's from historically the deepest amount of time is well really uh, two places one is right here this is this spot of Kihikayonge um, our largest uh, capital village for generations uh, today it's the site of Fort Wayne Indiana um, and then Kara described Wipichakionge, um, which is right here um, near the uh, where the 
uh, Nekawakame joins the uh, Wapashiki CP when it's the point at which the Wabash River becomes uh, navigable by canoes. Um, and it was a major um, landing point for a portage where people carried their canoes um, to be able to travel by water. Um, and then another part of my family comes from farther down um, the Wabash um, here where the Namacha Simisipi would meet the Wabash River. So I have two spots in the landscape where my family have lived um, for for a long time in, um, in what is today Indiana. Um, and of course, as Kara already mentioned, we're, we're cousins if you go back far enough. And so that those, those are overlapping family stories. Um, but let me um, zoom in here on the map. And you can see um, better, you can see the, the river names. And so to give you a sense of some of the, the ecology and the, the um, stories that these sites tell, um, if you look at the, the name for the Wapashikisipi, where the Wabash River flows through um, north central Indiana and then cuts down south, um, this river is named, um, it basically means like the sparkling white river and it's named for the limestone bedrock that was its base, um, or st still is its base, um, that prior to sedimentation um, caused by settlement, um, you would see this limestone base sparkling and reflecting the sunlight um, through the water. Um, and so that, that river name was anglicized into Wabash. Um, and it's true for um, the Wabash as well as many of its feeder streams that there are still today um, limestone cliffs and bluffs that are seen um, that are a visible sign of what is now covered in, you know, in silt in the river itself. Um, but to, to look at some other examples of the stories that the rivers tell, um, this river here, uh, the Mamewa or Namewa Sipiwe, um, today is known as the St. Mary's River and it begins in Ohio, um, but then it has its uh, terminus in, in Indiana where it forms the headwaters of the Maumee or the Tawawa Sipiwe. And in our language, this river means the Sturgeon River. And um, this, it, the, it's describing um, the high presence of sturgeon in this river during their seasonal um, spawning process, where they would come off of Lake Erie and come down the, the Tawawa Sipiwe, or the Maumee River, and then into the Namewa Sipiwe. Um, and um, this river will be full of um, of uh, sturgeon during that time of year, so much so that people joke that you could walk across uh, walk across the river um, on the backs of the sturgeon. Um, obviously, today that has changed for for multiple reasons, but the name um, encodes the the memory of that um, for us as a people. Um, hold on, just one second. Um, I'll just pick um, one more example um, to kind of highlight um, uh, relationships uh, told through, la through, through land and rivers. Um, and that's the Unzala Municipiwe here, um, which in English is the Salamone River, which is another anglicization of our, of our name for the river. And Unzala Mune is um, the bloodroot plant. Um, which is a, a beautiful, uh, small understory plant that grows in, um, uh, I, th I think it's fair to say, like semi-wet environments um, and likes the edges uh, near rivers. And um, this plant, uh, when you break it, it actually has a, a sap that looks like blood and was a very prominent uh, dye used by my community for dyeing um, clothing, other objects. Um, it has other... other um, historical uses in the community. And um, along this river was the largest prominent population of this plant. And so the river um, the river was named for it. Um, and that plant can still be found um, along this river. Although um, this river has um, drastically changed uh, in the years of settlement. And again, kind of coming back to the Wabash and the sediment in the Wabash, um, you know, the large levels of sediment in these rivers is due to decades of extreme flooding that followed settlement of our homelands and the draining of wetlands, the channelization of streams, um, and then the increased flow of water and rainstorms directly into the rivers. And in response to a series of catastrophic, catastrophic floods in Northwest Indiana um, in the uh, 20th century, um, they, the Army Corps of Engineers 
um, decided to build three dams uh, in north central Indiana to dam up the Unzala Muna Sipiwe, the Namacha Sindhu Sipiwe, and the Wapashiki Sipiwe um, to control the flow of water. And so those dams then um, obviously drown when you go when you go um, east from those dams, they drown parts of our homeland, historic sites, and change the plant and animal populations in those in those in those places in pretty dramatic and drastic ways. Um, so our relationships to these places are in some ways, um, you know, continual, um, but the places continue to change just as we continue to change. So we have to adapt um, adapt our practices. In some cases, you know, struggle pretty hard to maintain connections to different places that are actually underwater now. Um, but um, the the names remain like a really powerful um, teaching device for us to remember and, and continually reconnect with um, the stories of these places. Um, so I think I, I can I can stop here and see if folks have uh, questions about sort of river, river ecology and our historical lands. Um, and then we can talk a little bit more about um, uh, change over time and um, some, of the, some of the work that we're doing today. So any questions? Nothing right now. Hey, George, I'll, I'll jump in, I guess. Um, with the anglicizing of the names, um, I mean, do you have a sense of what percentage and, um, you know, how many of the names changed and how have you restored or sort of just gone with that uh, for these rivers? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, um, Kevin. And I would say um, my understanding is that in the Wabash River Valley, um, every single feeder stream for the Wabash has either its name is either a translation of our name um, or an anglicization of, of our name. Um, so I, it, so it's it's a hundred percent in terms of that they all reflect our names and it it really speaks to the level in which uh, as settlers came in, our culture was the dominant culture and so it, it shaped the naming conventions. Um, now as soon as you, uh, move out of the Wabash River Valley, you see some significant differences. So the Namewa Sipi is the St. Mary's River, and the Cochisa Sipi um, is the St. Joseph's River. So you see the sort of the Catholic influence from the earliest priests who were coming in, working to um, convert our people to Catholicism. Um, they also then start to name the landscape in, in a European way. Um, but, you know, as soon as you move just over the divide into the Wabash Valley, there's a, there's a shift there. Um, and a part of that is you just don't see as much of a Jesuit presence in that space in the same time period. Um, but, you know, the, the contrast here is the, in our language, the Tawawa Sipiwe, which is the Maumee River in English. Um, that river did not get a French name or a later, later an English translation of that French name. Um, and that's um, because the, the Ottawa presence was pretty strong and they called the river the Miami River. Um, because they used the river to travel to us. We called the river the Tawawa River, the Ottawa River, because we used the river to travel to them. And so that that naming convention that the Ottawa established of Maumee or Miami um, was the one that, that went out and was maintained. Um, and ours shows up a little bit in the historical sources. It's obviously one our people can do to use, but it didn't, it didn't make its way through in um, contemporary use by uh, Euro-American descendants. Um, but for us, it's a it's a it's an example of I think I give an example of our connection to a fish, the sturgeon, a connection to a plant, and then rivers also give us connections to other people. And so the Tawawa Sipiwe connects us to the Ottawa, who um, used to live you know more on the Lake Erie half of the river, um, and today are our neighbors in Miami, Oklahoma, where they too were forcibly removed um, in the roughly the same time period as as our forced removals. Did I answer the, the question fully? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It's fascinating. Other questions? Okay. So, um, this revitalization of connection to landscape 
um, really naturally leads us as Miamia people to think about, you know, what, what we do as and what we did as a community. Um, and as a community that experienced um, loss, extreme loss, uh, beginning in the, the mid 1800s, uh, which accelerated the turn of the 20th century, um, a lot of our uh, cultural ecological practices uh, rapidly declined or were severely altered by settlement. So an example of that is we know pre-contact with Europeans, our diet was heavily um, concentrated in um, tuberous plants harvested from wetlands, uh, which there are a lot of in our homelands before, before settlement, um, corn, uh, maize, which was our, our main agricultural product, and um, of the, the protein sources, white-tailed deer. Um, and those were the three dominant foodstuffs in, in community. Um, and what we see in the late 1800s is a drastic shift in diet to commodities provided by the United States government. Um, you know, white-tailed deer were extinct in Indiana um, by the 1930s. Um, so you see a, a decrease in that you know, hunted protein and more uh, reliance on um, on, ca on steer and cows on, on European cattle. Um, the wetlands were gone, so wetland tubers were gone from our diet, and we actually slowly stopped growing our own corn um, and started consuming grains like wheat. Um, so there's there's these dietary and ecological shifts as our connections to our lands shift we, as we have less and less access to the lands we used to use to feed ourselves. Um, you know, and you can imagine all of the um, all the shifts in dietary health, the way that that affects physical health, mental health is connected. You're experiencing oppressions. So all these things affected our community in really dramatic and negative ways. As we began to revitalize as a community, and there's all there's a whole host of changes that occur in between the losses of the early 20th century and revitalization in the 1990s. That, if you're interested in talking more about, we can come back to. But um, as we began to revitalize and do things like reconnect to place through language, um, we then began to ask ourselves more questions about, well, how do we interact with those places over the course of a whole year, um, you know, beyond just what this one story tells us. And um, it really led to a lot of interesting conversations and more questions in the community about, um, you know, what uh, gets traditionally in the literature called the seasonal round. How do a people behave across the, the cycle of a season, um, which is a common way in like American Indian studies, people look at um, cultural practices in the past. Um, and uh, boy, we found a lot of really interesting um, interesting responses to those questions, not really answers, um, responses to those questions by going back and talking to elders, by looking at historical sources, by looking at the language resources. And this just led us to ever, ever more, um, ever more complicated and really useful questions. And um, what this did is it led us towards producing um, what is today a, a lunar calendar system um, that is distributed to the community once a year and is one of the major, um, but not the only, timekeeping device we use in the community to organize ourselves and uh, carry out our, our practices. And so our, our timekeeping system, our, our means of tracking month time is inherently connected to place and ecology. Um, and the revitalization of this system and the use of it uh, in the diaspora ties the community together in an ecological web of practices that, you know, date back to before contact show change over time and um, serve as like uh, a, like a, a device of memory, but also a device of contemporary cultural practice. Um, and so I, I thought that um, we could spend um, some time looking at our, our lunar calendar and talking about um, seasonal practices of the past and of today. Um, and just to kind of frame this as we, as we go in, um, to looking at the lunar calendar, um, from a Meow Meow perspective, there's really two seasons. And this was a very different way for me to learn about, um, seasonal practices. Um, as someone who grew up, I grew up in Chicago, in Chicago, which I think definitively has four seasons. Although, um, sometimes, uh, one of those seasons gets lost as it just kind of spins through really fast, but, um, definitely feels like a four season kind of place um, to, to learn more about a different perspective of the progress of the seasons. And from a Meow Meow perspective, um, historically, and I think revitalized today, there's two seasons. There's Napidwiki, the season in right, we're in right now from our perspective, or what gets called summer in English, um, and Pepungi, 
um, what gets called winter in English. And those two seasons have very clear uh, demarcations between them. Um, summer ends when the thunderstorms go away and you have the killing frost that kills all the green growth and that ends summer. And then, then you're into Peipungi, you're into winter and winter lasts until the thunderstorms return in the spring, um, which is preceded by um, uh, thunder's wives, the frogs singing thunder home and frost disappearing and green growth returning. Um, and we have cultural taboos about activities that happen in one of those two seasons. Um, that's one of the ways we really know that they were perceived as as two. And then what in English I grew up calling uh, spring and some, uh, sorry, spring and fall are zones of transition. So they have names in our language. Meluhka meke gets translated as spring, te kuakeke gets translated as fall, but it really means like this phenomenon is happening. It's not a season. And there's some changes occurring in that window. So some really rapid changes occur in both those windows. And inside those windows is where that transition to summer or uh, winter begins. Um, and this is a, like I said, a, a different way of thinking about the seasons. Um, and um, when we're, we're working with our, our, our youth um, from the college level all the way down, this is one of the entry points that we start with um, so they can begin to think about our collective timekeeping system um, from a little bit of a different perspective. So the way our ancestors and the way we today break up the, this, the one year of, you know, of, uh, our year begins in the winter time, coming all the way back around again, um, is with the lunar months. And a month begins for us when the moon sprouts. Um, so for us, the new moon is not the astronomical new moon, which is um, this one down here at the bottom. Uh, the astronomical new moon is all black. Um, our, our month begins when um, there's a thin sliver of light on the right-hand side of the moon. And we say sakilwa. Uh, the moon has sprouted like a plant. It's, it's sprouted from the ground. Um, and then the month continues through as the, as the moon grows to full, about where we are right now. And then the moon begins, it begins to die away until it's sickly and gaunt, and then is fully dead. And then the next month sprouts when you see the, the, the moon again. And so this is a means of tracking a month time, which is uh, lunar month is uh, about 20, 29.5 days long. Um, and so it gives you a, a breakup of a whole year that doesn't exactly equal a solar year. It's 11 days shorter than the solar year. Um, but from our community's perspective, it was a way to keep track of, of month time um, to tell us uh, in a predictive kind of way, okay, what are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to be interacting with over the course of a year? Um, and then, of course, there's a whole system that our ancestors had to create for making up for that 11-day gap, um, because otherwise, over time, your ecological connections would shift out of focus. Um, so I, I, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, so before I jump into to showing the calendar, uh, Kara, is there anything you wanted to add about the seasons? And does anyone have any, any questions about either the seasonal breakdown for Miamia Mia people um, or the the breakdown of a lunar month from sprouting to, to dead and back again. Which I don't have anything to add. Okay. And there's no questions in the chat right now. Did anybody okay. else have a hand raised that we might have missed? Can you talk a little bit? You mentioned about youth, and I'm really curious about um, oh, if you can speak a little bit more about how some of these. Um, understandings are being uh, passed on to like children and youth and like through what sort of, you know, um, different institutions or is this through family or through schools or how, how is this, there's revitalizing happening with children? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Kara, do you want to start maybe talking about what we do here with the college students and then I can, yeah. I can jump to the younger groups? Mm -hmm. um, so here at Miami University, students who come, um, to attend, and like I said, we have 39 of them right now, they take a series of courses with us. So these are one credit classes um, and all of our students in their first through third years are all together in the class. Um, that's actually a really important piece of this um, is that everyone is together and that really um, allows for learning as a community. Um, and there's three topics. So actually this year is um, ecological perspectives and history. And we've been teaching about the lunar calendar. Um, 
And then next year will be language and culture. And then the third year, contemporary topics and sovereignty. And then in their senior year, students do an independent study project where they combine what they've learned in their major or minor with what they've learned in the Miami Heritage Program. Um, so for example, in our heritage course, in every single class, we start off the class by asking a series of questions. Um, so what moon is it? Um, so what month is it? What phase of the moon is it? What's the weather? And so again, connecting back to this ecological system and, and asking our students to follow along with us um, as we go through the cyclical time of both the month and the year. Um, and then George, you wanna talk about some of our other programs? Yeah. Yeah, so for, um, for uh, youth um, aged um, six to 16, um, we have a series of summer programs that we run in Miami, Oklahoma and in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, that are called Sakachoweta and Ewen Zapata. And there's actually two separate age breakdowns there. So they're two separate programs uh, that run in the same location. Um, <clears throat> and those programs have a series of cyclical themes that are covered um, that, that engage in, um, engage the, the young people in really like active doing kinds of learning. Um, and they all have heavy ecological components. Uh, each theme in one way or another leads back to place and ecology because that's the foundation as I said of who we are. And each time we touch upon place and ecology, we're almost always referencing the lunar calendar system and it telling us what we're supposed to be doing right now as Miamia people. Um, and then one year of the, of, for the older kids, for the Ewan Zapata kids, one year of that theme cycle, um, its focus is to teach the lunar calendar system in detail, um, both like sort of the, the main months um, of that particular summer cycle. Um, and then also the, the timekeeping solution that our ancestors created to keep the system in balance. So it's one of the things we talk about is that the calendar is a human created system and that they had to periodically modify the system to keep it in connection with the ecology. And while we don't expect all the young people to leave the program, especially the younger kids, to leave that year actually knowing how to run the system at a communal level, um, they leave with a fundamental understanding of the ecological and place-based connections and the notion that humans us as, as Miamia humans have to do something to keep the system working, that it requires like activity in our part. Um, it won't just run independently of us like the Gregorian calendar does, right? The Gregorian solar calendar we use, doesn't matter what I do or what Kara does, it's gonna keep running, right? There's other people who are making sure this huge timekeeping system um, is being used and um, you know that leap year is happening at the right moment. Um, for us, we as a small community have to take care of our calendar in a much more active way. Um, so it's less of a less of a passive system, I guess you could say for us. Um, and then I guess there's a, a third group that's growing in our community and that's young people who are growing up in households where the caregivers have this knowledge and are practicing it um, and are engaging with it at the communal level through activities so that um, you know, their parents are talking about it to them, or in some cases following it, but also like they know, oh, storytelling is beginning because this has happened in the community and that has a tie to the to the lunar calendar and the seasonal shifts. And that's the play that's one of the places we want to get back to as a community where it's just eventually happening in the household. Um, you know, it can always be reinforced through youth programming, um, but um that that home based education and practice is the place that it will become strongest and healthiest again, we think in the future. Great, great question. George and Kara, there also was um, actually two simultaneous questions posted exactly the same time, both on the same topic, which are asking about climate change and sort of what you're seeing of the impact seasons and climate change, please. Do you wanna to touch on that, Kara, you want me to? Yeah, I can touch a little bit on it. And I think, um, you know, we talk a lot about change in our community. Um, and so I think there's multiple ways of thinking about change. Um, and some of that is through like human created change. Like, and I think once we look at our calendar, we'll start to see like one of our month names 
is named after the Eastern elk, which today are extinct. So again, that's through human created consequences, right? That, that have created change to our calendar system. Um, Climate change is kind of a longer version of that same process, right? Where our ecology is changing and it's a little bit out of, it can create imbalances between the system that was created by our ancestors and what we're actually seeing in our environment around us. Um, and so it's just something that we talk about quite often at this point. We haven't like made necessarily like large changes to our lunar calendar system. However, it is something that we talk about quite frequently. So George has mentioned a couple of times that we only um, tell stories, certain stories in the winter time. So with climate change, what happens when that period is shifted or oftentimes shrinks this window in which we have um, to practice this one particular uh, Miamia cultural practice becomes smaller and smaller, right? And for us as a community, we have to continue to make decisions about our actions and the links to our environment. Um, and I think it's it's pretty difficult for us to, to see that happen um, because so much of, of what we do and how we think is connected to the environment. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, a somewhat different but connected issue in our community is that we are geographically um, separated from one another, right? So if I live in Florida, I'm not seeing these same ecological changes um, that you would if you lived in, in our homelands along the Wabash River Valley. Um, and so people are always asking us like, well, when can I tell winter stories, right? It's never where I'm not gonna ever get a killing frost. Um, so when do I tell winter stories? And for us, um, we come together as a community to make decisions around these things to say, okay, yes, we now think that it is you know, time to bring our winter stories out again um, or to put them away for the year. So it is, it's an interesting process, um, but as a small community, we have the ability to connect to one another in some unique ways to make these decisions as a community. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to that response. Um, was that, you said there were two questions, was that, was that both of them? Yes, they're both on that same topic. Okay. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. All right, well, I'd, I think um, that's a good time maybe to open up the lunar calendar and show it to you all. Hopefully this works. Perfect. Is everyone seeing that okay? A picture of a, a child's hand? Um, so this is really timely um, by pure coincidence. Um, so this is a, a wonderful photo of one of our youth um, holding a piakimine, a persimmon berry um, in her hand. And now is the time here in, in Oxford and in uh, up in Fort Wayne and also in Oklahoma where the persimmons are ripe and they're falling from the trees and they look really nasty. They're smashing on the ground, but that's actually when they're the most tasty. Um, if you're aware, if you're not aware of this fruit, um, Maybe we don't want you to be aware because we want to keep it a secret to ourselves, um, but it's really good. Um, but it's only good once it becomes like smashed and nasty looking um, because it's um, it's actually got a high level of tannins in it. And if you eat it um, when it's really firm, it puts like a fur in your mouth. It's really nasty, um, but it's a wonderful fruit. Um, we like to process it and eat it raw, but we also then freeze it and we use it all year round to make baked goods out of. It's just got a unique flavor that's not replicated by any other fruit. Um, even the Asian persimmon khaki doesn't reflect the, it's not the same flavor spectrum as the, the smaller persimmon here in, in, um, in this part of uh, our homelands. Um, so this is the cover of our flip calendar for 2021. And the Miami Center is in charge of producing this flip calendar and distributing it to the tribal community on behalf of the Miami tribe. 
Um, and the calendar is usually filled with photos of our community today, sometimes some historic photos, but usually today photos um, that usually in some way connect to the ecology. And we use the calendar um, to, as I said, like jointly plan events. It also has educational components. So for those who are new to it, there's always a chance to be educated. Um, so that explains the, the seasonal changes, the, the month uh, changes um, with the, the actual phases of the moon from our perspective, um, and then has each of the, the months with a corresponding community photo. So this is um, Wawita Kilswa, which um, this is that um, practice that our ancestors developed to keep the calendar in balance. So once every three years, um, we bring back the lost moon or Wawita Kyoswa to bring the calendar back into balance. Um, and I'll, I'll talk in one second about um, how we know wh when, when to do that. Um, but the lost moon always occurs in the dead of winter. Um, so it's usually winter storytelling time when the lost moon is occurring. So this is a shot from um, storytelling. I think the last time we were all together as a community pre-COVID. So it's kind of a bittersweet photo to look at. Um, for a tribal community that's in diaspora, being able to come together is 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 even more critical it's critical to all communities right but we're forced into diaspora because of our history and it's difficult for us to come together and during covid of course we couldn't come together um and that that of course has a huge impact on on um our, our work as a community but um, these photos help remind us of of good things that are coming back soon um so you can see then the events for that month you can see um, this month has 29 days. You can't have half a day. So our month, we, for just logistical purposes in our calendar, we switch back and forth from 29 and 30 day months. Um, the first month of the year, um, and when we have our lunar new year, Wehikikikatwe is Mahkunza Kioswa, young bear moon. Um, and this is, the, this is a moon that connects to the life cycle of the American black bear. Um, and this is when their cubs would start to exit their den for the first time after being born a month or so previously. And it's a sign that things are waking up. So it's still winter time, but it's a sign that there's like a softening happening and that things are starting to wake up. And for us, we know that near the end of this month, we should be getting ready for maple sugaring, that the trees are starting to wake up because daylight's getting longer and they're gonna start sending sap up. And so we know it's getting close to time to tap the trees. So this you know, connection, this webbing of animal behavior and plant behavior um, you know, tells us, um, you know, tells us what, what we should be doing and how we should be behaving in this time period. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't go into detail on every month, but I'll just kind of touch on a couple. This is on Dekwa Kilswa, the crow moon. Uh, Chechakwa Kilswa, the sandhill crane moon, connected to sandhill crane migrations, which pass right through our traditional homelands. Um, and as also the sandhill crane is like the the animal most associated with our tribal community. It's the symbol of our community. Um, historically and to this day. Wichkuwia uh, Kiloswa, the whippoorwill moon. Uh, whippoorwill tells us it's time to plant corn, so it's the first of our agricultural months. Um, and it's another example of ecological change. Whippoorwills have become a lot less common in, near the places where we're living today because um, they need old growth forests. They're ground nesting birds. And so we have to watch like birding websites to find out when the whippoorwills are back and calling in our homelands. Um, usually in uh, south, southern Indiana, um, there's enough sightings of them that we can tell it's it's time to plant. Um, and then I'll stop here for a second uh, with Popsock on Nipin Wicked, the midsummer moon. These are two of our these are two of our young people who came through our youth programs. Um, and uh, the young woman on the right here is actually a um, sophomore at, at my university. Remember that correctly, Kara? She's a junior. Ah, junior. I was off in one year. Um, <laughs> that, that darn COVID years throw me off. Uh, she's a junior at my university. Um, but they both, we've known them both since they were, well, five, six years old, at least. Um, Popsaka Nipenwick is a midsummer moon. And when we were doing the research, um, to be able to revitalize this calendar probably took two... 15 years of research and then five years of really focused, dedicated research because it wasn't an operating system. Um, and so using historical and linguistic records, we were able to, to revitalize this system. And one of the things we understood is that a regular year had 12 lunar months, but some years had 13 months. And we couldn't figure out 
how, when, how did they know when to add the 13th month? And of course, one way you could do it is just by doing the math, um, by crunching the numbers. And we had people who helped us do that and they gave us their, their findings. But we knew that there had to be also a cultural mechanism at work. And um, what, what we eventually identified is that um, one of the days that our people tracked is, is Pasakachkanga here, which is oftentimes on June 21st in the Gregorian calendar or the summer solstice. And the, the name of this, um, of this uh, phenomenon references the sun passing as close to overhead as it gets during a year. Obviously, that only happens at the equator, but um, in our homelands, it's, it's more close to overhead on this day than any other day of the year. And um, you'll notice that this name also means midsummer. So there's this idea of being um, mid or in between. And uh, we came to the realization that there's a connection between these two names, Pasakakanga and Papsaka Nipinwiki, and that the summer solstice should fall inside the midsummer moon. Um, and over the course of three years, it eventually moves to near the end of the month. And if nothing was done, the next year, the summer solstice would fall in uh, what's called Kishinguya Kilswa, or the green corn moon. Uh, when you're beginning to harvest the first round of your corn. Um, and if that then continues over multiple years, eventually um, eventually it, it's falling in a, in a month that's named for the winter time, let's say. And you can't have the summer solstice falling in the winter time, right? It's just, it cult, there's no cultural match there. And so this led us to create a cultural mechanism that's accentuated by mathematical tools to know that once you've reached a point where um, the summer solstice is going to fall out of the proper month, that's the signal that you should insert the 13th month and bring the calendar uh, back into balance again. Um, our ancestors probably did it in a slightly different way. Um, we have limited references, but the Jesuits seem to indicate that they just inserted the lost month every 36 months. So no matter where it was in the calendar, just every 36 months, they would insert the lost moon to bring things into balance. For us, we really wanted the lost moon to fall in the winter time because it just helps. There's not a lot of ecological change in the winter time. It makes more sense to us today, the way we're living to do that. And so we regularized it in a way that's that's different from the way our ancestors did it. Um, but we think the anchor point, the summer solstice was the same, just the way you dealt with it was, was different um, in terms of when you inserted the moon. Um, and then just to, to quickly spin through the rest of these months, uh, green corn moon, that's when the, the corn's in the milk stage, when you can eat it like sweet corn off the cob. Our, our corn's a flower corn, so it only lasts in that state for a little while. Um, Mishiwia Kilswa, so this is the moon that Kara mentioned, the eastern elk moon. Um, for, so for those of us that are from the Midwest, um, the eastern elk have been extinct since the 1840s. Um, and if you're, if you're familiar with like the Roosevelt elk, when they're bre when they're in their breeding cycle, they bugle. And to me, it sounds like a, like a whale in the woods. It's this beautiful eerie sound. Um, and that would have been sounding all throughout, you know, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, um, in, th in this time of year as, as they entered their mating cycle. Um, and now they're absent. So their, their song isn't there. And so we use this month as a, as a talking to discussion about change. Um, and. Um, we ask our community to think about, um, because our calendar has always changed, we look back and we can see in the historical record that they changed the names of months. Um, you know, will we want to change this month name at some point? When will we be ready to make that decision as a community? And if so, what will we change the name to? Um, and right now we just ask that question and we, and we leave it be. And maybe the community will decide to keep it as a memory of the past, but um, it's uh, important that we ask. Um, these are my two favorite months to talk about, Sha Sha Kaiola Kioswa, uh, the grass burning moon, and uh, Kiolia Kioswa. This is the month we're in right now, the smoky burning moon. These are both uh, moons connected to anthropogenic fire. So our people, just like most people in North America, lit seasonal fires on purpose to shape the environment um, due to our relationships with plants and animals. Um, and, you know, all of us evolved together to thrive in an environment where fire was used regularly. Um, and these two months correspond to that. One is when, this name also gets translated as when the grass burns in streaks because there's enough moisture left in, in the burnable material that it just kind of smolders and streaks out. Um, and then in Kiolia Kioswa, um, there, the plant matter is dead enough that you really get hot fires that produce smoke that kind of clouds the sky and obscures your vision at times. Um, but this is what produced what Europeans called like a park-like environment. They just thought it was like, 
naturally that way. And it was produced through human action, um, the clearing of the underbrush. Um, yep. And then we're heading uh, past where we are right now into the beginning to head into the winter months, the young buck moon and buck moon connected to um, the rut and the breeding cycles of white-tailed deer. And Makhlaq, you also have the last month of the year, um, the black bear month when the older females uh, give birth to their um, cubs. And then we would come back around again to Makhkunza Kyoswa and the, the whole cycle would begin again. Um, so you can see, right, unsurprisingly, that a, there's a cyclical kind of thinking here about life and connection to place and community. Um, it's a calendar that um, reflects, um, here's one of those limestone bluffs in the Mississippi River Valley. Um, it's a, it reflects our deepest time experience in what is today Indiana. Um, but the ecology of Canvas in Oklahoma, of Kansas and Oklahoma is uh, similar enough that the calendar functions uh, pretty well in both those places as well. Um, and so it, it can be used to unify our, our three um, homelands. Um, although as, as Kara rightly pointed out, it presents challenges for those who live um, farther in diaspora. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and um, I think we're, we're almost out of time, but if there are questions about our, um, about our lunar calendar and how we use it today as a community, I'd love to, for Kara and I to help uh, respond to any of that. I, I'll jump in first, but um, certainly encourage others to talk. Um, I found this so fascinating. Thank you uh, both. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, because um, I feel like I've been more aware of your work of late. And if you guys are, how you're doing in terms of, are you feeling burnt out? There's so much that needs to be done and so many exciting things to do. And I'm just curious how you, you both are faring um, as m perhaps more attention is being drawn to these issues. <laughs> um, things are certainly speeding up in our world, I think. Um, you know, the Miamia Center was purposeful in being a little bit under the radar for quite a while. Um, really the first almost 15 years of the Miamia Center, things just happened on their own and it, the work wasn't especially visible. Um, that has changed with a couple of things. Obviously, um, Daryl Baldwin, our director, has won some national acclaim with the MacArthur Fellowship in 2016. And this year he was nominated to sit on the National Council for the Humanities. Um, Miami University is putting a larger emphasis on this. Um, President Crawford is certainly very interested in, and sees this as something that makes Miami University unique and that they want to support. Um, so I'd say there's kind of two sides to this coin, right? It's that there's, there's more going on. Um, we feel like we have more work to do. However, our team is also growing, um, which brings in new skill sets, new energy, um, and also that there's just a deepening of the relationship. So, you know, last week we actually had an event that was a commemoration of the 175th anniversary of removal of Miami people. So we're, you know, this entire year obviously is that commemoration, but um, in October, it was the start of, of that removal process. And I don't think we would have, um, necessarily been willing to have an event like that even a decade ago. It's because of the strengthening of this relationship and the trust that's been built that we are willing to share, you know, so much of our own culture through an event like that. And so like certainly there there's pros and cons to that, but um, it also means that we're we're able to share more both on campus at Miami University as well as in the region which we hope will only serve to benefit our tribal nation in the future, right? It might be a generation from now, but if more people grow up learning and understanding about the Miami people and indigenous peoples broadly, 
our hope is that they will be more supportive and understanding of our work um, and that that will only serve to strengthen our tribal nation moving forward. Well, there was a question that was posted in the chat of, could you tell us about the dish in the Keolia Kilhiswa that was in the calendar? Yeah, um, so I went back and looked at the image because I didn't remember, remember off the top of my head. Um, so it's it's three different acorn squashes made into bowls. Um, and in one is a wild rice um, stew with cranberries. Um, in another, I'm pretty sure I was I was there on this day, but it was a long time ago. Actually, it's an old photo. I'm pretty sure it's a roasted cattail root stew, um, which is, um, you know, again, another wetland tuber, although not actually one of the primary ones we ate because it's you know, tiny tuber for a lot of work, um, but it's, it tastes good once you roast it. And then the third, uh, which is what you'd expect to find, is just uh, squash soup, um, pureed squash heated in broth. Um, but it's one of the, the fun things we still do to get together as a community is, is cook um, a mix of, you know, the traditional ingredients, but also using other ingredients that have come to our community over time. So food highlights that, that change over time that is a part of all communities' story. Are there any um, resources you would point folks to um, for learning more that you, you think are, are good or useful? Yeah, yeah. So I'd recommend um, our community blog, um, which is um, got many of the removal um, story, much of the removal story that Kara mentioned, which is being published right now to correspond with each day 175 years ago. Um, and then just as our talk today, intermixed history and ecology, um, and then of course fronted our, our lives today as a, as a contemporary vibrant community. The blog also includes ecology, weather reports, uh, contemp articles about the contemporary community. So it's really uh, beautifully um, exhibits everything we talked about today. Um, and then, you know, for those of you who are working in the Midwest, um, or even like the near, the near West, um, our our online dictionary has a lot of you know just wonderful resources so that you can look up tree species names, animal names, you know. So for those creating educational curricula, um, we we like people to include our language, um, especially with a note that like this is a living language with a living people attached to it, a vibrant community, you know, who want to share um, and want our voices heard. Um, so we encourage we encourage folks to to use that as much as they're as much as they're comfortable, and to a certain extent are willing to help uh, look at the way in which our language is included in things and give feedback. Um, you know, as long as the turnaround time isn't too short. Karen George, may I ask a really um, open-ended question? Sorry, uh, if it's too unspecific to so feel ignored, but in, in sort of hearing um, <clears throat> your stories and how you're revitalizing the language and also in a past conversation with Wesley Leonard when he visited Oxford, uh, I was, he, you know, just, and also the chat we had in uh, earlier in the year, uh, all these conversations and your cultural and language revitalization and uh, getting, um, connected back to uh, the homeland that you were forcefully removed from. Um, and then reestablishing those connections uh, to me has some parallels as, uh, you know, in a room full of conservation uh, experts and biologists and conservation enthusiasts and people who are interested in taking care of, in, of the environment. Uh, we, are, we all are trying to connect to the place that we are finding ourselves in and trying to connect to the uh, cycle of nature around us and trying to understand it uh, beyond just scientific understanding so that we care for this place that we're in. So I'm, I'm wondering, not necessarily uh, coming to you uh, to just get your sage words, but more 
Are there parallels in your uh, revitalization of culture and connection to your homeland nature that we can draw inspiration from, or learn from, or at least reflect upon as you know people who are trying to take care of the environment in our you know neck of the woods? And I mentioned this um, <clears throat> because um, we have a few courses from Dragonfly that goes to uh, different locations uh, around the globe, um, looking at uh, spiritual connections to nature and conservation. And in one of the courses that I taught for a few years, people would go to India and look at um, how cultural beliefs led to conservation of um, forest groves. And they would just sort of sometimes scratch their head um, as to how they can bring that connection back to their locations. And I have to mention uh, that uh, there are indigenous knowledge bases all around in the US. They're just not as, as made into a forest grove, perhaps, or it, it would be, it was just forced removed. So I think there are some direct parallels in my mind, uh, but I'm curious uh, what your experience have been uh, and how it could just connect to the broader um, efforts in the conservation movement trying to connect back to the land. So I guess one thing that I would say um, is just that because we are in this process of revitalization, most of us grow up in, you know, mainstream American culture, right? And so, so we also, many of us, have the same perspectives on nature um, until we have access to a Miamia worldview in which then we start to recognize a new way of thinking about things, right? And, and from a Miamia perspective, what we're usually telling our students is, is primarily just to be aware of your surroundings, right? And it's that, that awareness and a pretty intimate understanding of your environment that allows you to connect to it in a variety of ways. Um, and so this is what we're trying to do with our students, especially this year where one of their assignments is to pick a tree species and watch it for an entire year. And to get to, under, to, get to understand that individual tree, but also that individual tree species, um, so I guess that's just to say that I think we can all come to understand new perspectives if we just spend the time and we tell our students, um, especially the younger students, look up, look down, look all around. It's about spending that time getting to know and reacquainted with the environment that's around you. And I think you'll be really surprised how much you, you really understand. And then for us, a lot of our research is, is coming out of historical documents, right? So you're probably not going to be looking into Miami historical documents, but there's certainly a research aspect to this, right, that will aid you as you start to personally reacquaint yourself with the environment to also bring in that scientific understanding. And those two things can certainly be complementary in a wide variety of ways. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with Kara. Uh, I think the one challenge as I think through your question, Shafkat, is I understand the question as an individual seeking. And what's different for us is while we might be working, of course, with each of our youth as individuals, we see them as an interconnected web of a, of a larger family um, who have a a deep and enduring connection to a specific set of places that in some ways you could say we didn't choose. Like it's just where we either came about or where we were forcibly moved to. And those kinds of ecological relationships aren't chosen so much as individuals. And it's my sense as someone, as Kara said, who also is a citizen of the United States who grew up in Diaspora in Chicago, that for many of my family who aren't Miamia, they, even those who are ecologically minded, they can move from Chicago to Maryland to Washington State, and it just they can then create a new wherever they go, and they can be responsible 
um, human beings in those places, but it's not tied to like a place where it has to be. And as a Meow Meow person, that it actually kind of interests me the way in which other members of my family can kind of just willy nilly move to different places. And like, I can't, I can live in another place for a little while, but I always have to come back to the places where my people are from and where we still are to this day. And I think that groupness is something that has sadly become broken in the United States and it's part of what needs to be repaired. And so if I would say like a step beyond what we can all do as educators to connect ourselves and our students to the environment is to begin to think about how do human groups become more connected to the environment in a meaningful and lasting way rather than you know to be frank a very capitalist way that i keep moving around wherever the work is and that's what decides my relationship with the environment not something else that's tied to like a larger group identity and i realize i've oversimplified things quite a bit but it just struck me in that moment there's a really important difference between the individual perspective and the group perspective um, and at least in my experience the group perspective is really absent in the united states culture um, in most places not all places but in most places i've lived And I would just add to that, you know, that's one of the reasons why it's important for us to have this relationship with Miami University is that for our students who live across the entire country, it, it is a bit of a homecoming to get to spend at least four years in our homelands. So as we're teaching them about the environment that's happening in our homelands, which is tied to this entire ecological knowledge system that we've just been talking with you about today. Um, and so you know, it's not really by accident, right, that this is that this is all happening within our historical lands. Well, I know we've we've gone a bit over time, um, but it's been so fascinating again. And thank you both for sharing so much. Um, I'm sure everyone's really appreciated it. Um, and like we said, we'll, we'll have another cafe in a month. Um, and I really look forward to, you know, watching and, and following these, what you shared, your links that you shared. Um, the one, the blog is, is very impactful. Um, so I'll be looking at that. And yeah, everyone's saying thank you. So um, I, guess, I guess that's it, unless anyone else has any last words. Um, I was, I was going to thank you all too. I, I, I just have to say it was, it's just been an honor to hear this. I, I've been in Miami since I was a student in 1981 or something, right? You and, and um, it's so funny the way you described it. We tried to stay under the radar for a long time because that's exactly how we described Project Dragonfly. Because <laughs> we're really trying to do more of a, a reform. It's more of a re educational reform initiative, and you just run into all sorts of, of difficulty when you do that. So I really appreciate, and it's so funny because I mean, you know, we have inquiry community voice, and um, and we often talked about how you can go anywhere from like the you know, wetlands of, of Florida to the deserts of Arizona, and you open up every single ecology text, and, and you know, it's all the same, right? I, we, we always teach in these boxes throughout education, and we work so hard to disconnect people from the very things that you are, are reconnecting people to. So I just want to tell you, how, you know, the lack of questions for me anyways, it's just, there's so much that you're doing, which I don't yet understand because it's such a particular perspective, but I, I really do appreciate um, how important that work is. I just want to say that and I hope we have a chance to work more um, in the future. All right. Well, with that, thanks again. And yeah, good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you all.